Hello. In this movie, we will look at cross-sections of male and female Ascaris, which are roundworms. I will point out structures that you should recognize for the lab practical, and discuss some of the important features of these organisms as they relate to the classification we use for them. Ascaris, as roundworms, are placed in the phylum Nematoda. Roundworms are found in a wide variety of habitats, including moist terrestrial habitats and many aquatic habitats. Almost all are tiny, and most are free-living. However, there are agricultural pests and also parasites of various animal species. Ascaris lumbricoides is an intestinal parasite found in pigs, sheep, squirrels, apes, and humans. Ascaris are used in biology labs because they are large enough to be observed easily. Here we have a cross-section of a male Ascaris, greatly magnified, of course. We are going to identify the main structures. First, there is the cuticle, which is the outermost layer of the specimen. It is a proteinaceous structure, which is secreted by the next layer, the epidermis. The red area that you can see is muscle. There is only one layer of muscle in roundworms, and the fibers run the length of the body, and so are referred to as longitudinal muscle. In a living specimen, this layer would not appear so thick. This appearance is the result of making a thin slice of the specimen, which leaves the fibers hanging loose. The large open space that you can see in the center, the white area, is called the pseudocelum or hemocele, or more generally referred to as the body cavity. It is called the hemocele because this serves as the circulatory system, distributing nutrients and gases, as well as being the cavity in which the body organs are located. The large S-shaped structure that you can see here is the intestine. Unlike the planaria that you may have looked at earlier, Ascaris and other roundworms have a complete digestive system, with a mouth at one end and an anus at the other. This is considered to be more efficient for digesting food and eliminating waste than a gastrovascular cavity. The other structures that you can see, these dark purple structures here and here, as well as this lighter structure here, are all part of the male reproductive system. To better understand what you are looking at, Let's take a look at a dissected specimen of Ascaris. This is available to you in the laboratory. The reproductive system in a male Ascaris consists of a very long tube that varies in diameter. The portion of the tube farthest upstream, so to speak, is the testis, which has a very narrow diameter. These very small tubes that are visible here are all part of a single testis. This is where cells that are going to become sperm originate. As these cells develop, they move down the length of the testis and into the larger diameter tube that you can see here, known as the vas deferens. The cells will continue to move down the length of this tube, which you can see continues to increase in diameter, until they eventually reach this much larger diameter tube, known as the seminal vesicle. By this time, the cells have completed development and are mature sperm. The sperm will remain in the seminal vesicle until copulation. Looking back at the cross-section of the male Ascaris, you can see eight different sections of the vas deferens. These vary somewhat in diameter, and if you look carefully, you can see that the cells within the tube increase in size as the tube becomes larger. Once the sperm have completed development, as mentioned earlier, they are stored in a much larger section of tube called the seminal vesicle. If we compare the male with the cross-section of a female Ascaris, we find that most of the structures are the same. You can see the cuticle and the epidermis, the longitudinal muscle, the pseudocelum, or hemocele, and the intestine. The many small circular structures are part of the female reproductive system. The smallest are part of the ovary. 
This is once again a long tube and the cells that will become ova, or eggs, originate here. As the cells develop and grow, they move into the oviduct. Once again, the diameter progressively increases as one moves from the ovary to the uterus. The ova continue to develop as they move through the oviduct. Once they have finished development and have been fertilized, they move into the uterus. We will look at the uterus shortly. Let's look at a dissected female ascaris to get a better idea of what the reproductive system looks like. This is available to you in the laboratory, of course. The female reproductive system is paired, having two of every structure except the vagina, which is visible on the right. The vagina branches into two uteri. Each uterus is connected to an oviduct. You can see sections of it here. The oviduct, in turn, is connected to the ovary, the very smallest diameter tubes that are visible here. As with the male reproductive system, each half of the female reproductive system is a single long tube of decreasing diameter, moving from the vagina to the ovary. Here we have a cross-section of a different female ascaris. Sections of the oviduct are visible along the bottom. You can also see sections of the two uteri with the contents plainly visible. Let's take a closer look at these. This is a higher magnification view of the female ascaris. Here are the sections of the oviduct along the lower side of the specimen. And this very large tube here is the uterus. Close examination of the cells inside the uterus reveals that each has a shell surrounding it. Just as in birds, the egg must be fertilized before the shell is secreted. Therefore, in Ascaris, fertilization is internal. Sperm are introduced into the vagina by copulation. They travel through the uteri to the oviducts and fuse with the ova. Shells are secreted as the zygotes pass into the uteri. As development begins immediately, most of the cells that you see here are actually embryos. Once these embryos reach a certain developmental stage, they become dormant. At this point, the shelled embryos are released into the digestive tract of the host organism, and they will eventually be expelled with the host's feces. These shelled embryos can remain viable for long periods in soil or on vegetation. If eaten by a new host, the shell will dissolve and the embryo will resume development and grow into an adult ascaris. Our last topic with respect to the ascaris concerns the digestive system. Here we have a very high magnification view of the wall of the intestine. If you look carefully, you can see that it consists of a single layer of cells. These cells are referred to as simple columnar epithelium. Simple because it is a single layer of cells, columnar due to the shape of the cells, and epithelium because it is a layer that forms a surface, in this case with the lumen of the intestine. The lumen is where the food is located during digestion. The ascaris food is already partially digested by the host organism, but they must complete the process and then absorb the nutrients. Looking closely at the inner edge of the epithelium, here, you can see that it resembles the bristles of a brush. In fact, it is sometimes referred to as a brush border. It actually consists of a large number of tiny, finger-like projections known as microvilli. These greatly increase the surface area for the absorption of nutrients. Once absorbed, the nutrients move through the epithelial cells and are released into the hemocele, or pseudocelum. Nutrients are distributed throughout the body by the liquid contained within the hemocele. Why is this cavity called a pseudocelum? The body cavity of some organisms, such as yourself, is called simply a coelom. So why pseudo? A coelom is defined as a cavity that is surrounded on all sides 
by tissues that have been derived from mesoderm, one of the three germ layers that form early in embryological development. A pseudocoelom, as seen in our ascaris, is only partially surrounded by mesoderm-derived tissue. Although the muscle layer here, this red over on the left-hand side, is mesoderm-derived tissue, the simple columnar epithelium of the intestine is derived from endoderm, which is another germ layer. Biologists consider this difference significant enough to give this cavity a different designation. The type of body cavity, or lack of a body cavity, is used as one criterion when classifying animal phyla, as we will discuss in lecture. I hope this video helps you to better understand what you are looking at in laboratory, and that it helps you to be better prepared for the upcoming laboratory practical.